Pacifying Eastern Congo, leaders of Eastern and Central African countries agree to deploy a joint force in the area as M23 rebels continue to assert their authority. But is military action the answer to this crisis and what does it mean for security in this volatile region? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. Rebels in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo are on a mission to repair their image. The M23 rebel army, which seized control of areas along the border with Rwanda, is now establishing its own administration, complete with ministries, committees and local councils. The group is trying to present itself as a new type of Congolese army, as a stabilizing and liberating force. But people in the region remain skeptical of their motives. Al Jazeera's Peter Gresta reports from the town of Ruchuru. This is M23, trying to look like a government. Jambu, jambu. The rebel army seized the regional center of Ruchuru a month ago. The commander looks more like a campaigning politician than a rebel soldier, shaking hands as much for our camera as for local goodwill. In areas it controls, the militia is establishing its own administrations, complete with ministers and committees and local governments. <laughs> We want people to rule themselves in the towns that we take over. We want them to be empowered. We want them to elect their own leaders. As the military, it's not for us to seize power. In Ruchuru, that idea is already taking shape. The committee elected by the townspeople has replaced Kinshasa's mayor. And they've called for people to hand in weapons and military equipment. Someone brings in a grenade launcher and a machine gun. It all gets passed to the rebel command. The committee says it's an act of confidence, not of submission. This is not the militia they expected when it first attacked town. We were surprised because since M23 took over, we haven't heard any gunfire in town or reports of any civilian killings. So this style of leadership is really surprising us. This seems to support the theory contained in a recent UN report that Rwanda is trying to use M23 to extend its model for stability over the border into the lawless eastern Congo, something both Rwanda and the rebels deny. M23 is trying to present itself as a new type of Congolese army, as a stabilizing, liberating force rather than the old-fashioned gang of thugs. But there is still an overriding emotion of fear here, and there are some habits they can't seem to shake. For a rebel force thinly stretched across an expanding territory, the town's population of fit young men seems too much to resist. I want them to leave because they are harassing us. They are demanding that each family give five people to serve the army. But I've never done that and I don't want to join them. So M23 isn't an entirely benign force, but it is behaving in a way that people here simply aren't used to. And for better or for worse, they're not leaving without a fight. The leaders of the DRC, Rwanda and nine other nations have been meeting in Kampala for the International Conference on the Great Lakes region. They've been discussing cooperation against armed rebels in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and on Tuesday they agreed to deploy a joint force in the eastern part of the country. Details of the size and makeup of the joint force are yet to be finalized, but the decision marks a breakthrough for regional states. The government of the DRC has persistently accused Rwanda of supporting the M23 rebels, but Rwanda continues to deny the accusation. Now, history appears to be repeating itself in the DRC. For almost 20 years, ethnic rivalries have led to fighting across the eastern border. In 1994, the conflict in Rwanda begins, leading to the genocide of mostly Tutsis. By June 1994, the Tutsis take power in Rwanda and Hutus flee to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, in the DRC, Laurent Kabila comes to power in 1997, backed by Rwanda. But Kabila loses Rwanda's support in 1998, sparking five years of conflict. The war ends in 2003. Rwanda and the DRC sign a peace deal six years later, and Congolese Tutsi rebels are integrated into the army. 
But in March of this year, the Congolese Tutsi fighters who set up the M23 group stage an army mutiny. The DRC says they're getting support from the Tutsi-led government in Rwanda. So could military intervention end the rebellion in eastern Congo? Let's discuss this with our guests from Washington, D.C., Mvemba Dizolele, a lecturer at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. From Berlin, Mary Roger Biloa, editor of Africa International, a Pan-African magazine. And joining us by broadband from Nairobi, Jason Stearns, former UN coordinator of the Group of Experts on Congo and director at Rift Valley Institute. Jason Stearns has also written a few books on Congo, including Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, The Collapse of the Congo, and the Great War of Africa. Welcome to all our guests. Let's begin with Mvemba Dizolele. Are African leaders then on the right path in agreeing to this regional military force for the DRC? Um, well, it seems like um, that's the path they're trying to take. Uh, the problem is not so much the idea itself. The problem will be the implementation of the idea, meaning who will staff that force, who's going to fund it, and uh, how or whether it will be accepted on, on both parties, meaning the DRC side and also uh, the Rwandan side. Can they uh, all, those are can really they, the issues. Can they all hand. agree on what would constitute a quote-unquote neutral force? I think that's a tough proposition. It will be really tough because you, you see already a, sh um, a schism that is emerging. You have countries from the uh, Southern African Development Community who are forcing um, pushing for their own involvement. Then you have countries from the Eastern African community, namely Uganda, Rwanda, and others, who also want to be part of this. Now, we know that in the past, both Rwanda and Uganda have invaded Congo, so their credibility in the eyes of the Congolese is very slim. This is a serious problem, but it also raises the other question. The, co the DRC already is home to the largest international force, which is MONUSCO the UN force that has been in Congo now over a decade. Why can't that mission, uh, that organization, that force that is already on the ground take that assignment? Then that also raises a new set of questions. I don't think this is going to work. Jason Stearns, uh, let's take this point on then. If the UN, with its biggest peacekeeping mission in the world, 17,000 troops couldn't stop the violence in the eastern DRC, can a regional military force do that, uh, leaving aside all these issues of staffing and funding uh, and other complicating factors? I'm very skeptical at the moment. I agree with Mbemba that uh, it will be difficult to find the funding, it will be difficult to find the troops, uh, it will be difficult to find a political agreement among states about this, about this force. And I think there is a real danger that the can will just get kicked down the road and that we'll end up discussing this issue further and further in meetings across the continent, but that nothing will happen and the military situation in Eastern Congo will continue to escalate. So why agree on this then? Is this simply buying time? And, and in whose interest does it work? Well, it, it works in the interest of the military actors who are trying to, to make further gains in the field, I would say. But, uh, but this is, I mean, the initiative comes from all sides. It would be unfair to say the initiative comes from one side or the other. Uh, they've all agreed on, on this force uh, or on these talks about creating a force. But I really, I'm afraid this could be a false hope. The Congolese, as Mbemba was, say, was saying, are trying to convert the UN peacekeeping mission into this force, which would be by far the easiest and fastest way of doing this, given the fact they're already on the ground and they already have experience in the area, they already have funding. The big problem there is that you have to change their mandate um, and give them a more aggressive mandate. So at the moment they're there for peacekeeping, it has to become a peace enforcement mission, which would be much riskier. And I don't think that either the UN Security Council or the countries that provide troops, largely South Asian countries, India, Pakistan, um, would agree to that more aggressive mandate that would put their soldiers at risk. Mary Roger Bilowa, what real prospects then are there for a lasting solution if the focus is on this military force for the moment at least? Are the political problems, the underlying problems being ignored? That exactly the problem. That exactly my point is that, uh, of course, what is happening now, as, as everybody sees, it, the, the, the fastest way to stardom and, and money and power is just to, in power, in power in, in, let's say, in uh, 
in poor countries like uh, RDC, is to build a militia, is to get support from, uh, from a foreign country like Rwanda and, and Uganda. And then you have, you hear that there are thousands, seven, uh, uh, 70, ten, 70, sorry, uh, one, seven uh, thousand. Uh, troops being there already, and the head of state meeting, and uh, Hillary Clinton uh, uh, interfering, and uh, government is deciding to to curb or to stop the aid, the military aid to Rwanda, just because of troops of militias building up in the eastern uh, in eastern uh, uh, Congo, and this has been going on for decades. So. First of all, I think there is a way, there, there is a, soli a, a solution in the in the army, a military solution. It's uh, you have a troops against you, and you have to fight back as a military a troop too. But the problem is, uh, this is but, but a, isn't, long, isn't a short term isn't a, solution. Isn't a military solution doomed to fail though if it doesn't take into account these uh, bigger problems, these issues but the of the real military so solution? Okay, you know the real military solution, the sustainable one, would be to help the government of RDC have a solid and strong army, to have a strong state. And that uh, we, uh, so, so much time has been wasted for that. You know, sending people there, you know, you have the UN people who are not really in a position to move and uh, they are being there and you have a, 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 a huge trail of violence and rape and, and, uh, and human rights abuse and that has been going on and going on and now you hear that the same people supporting the, uh, the, uh, the rebels are sitting at the table and saying well we want to be part of the troops to, make, to, to be in the peacekeeping mission. So this is all, this is, it doesn't seem very serious. Jason Stearns, just how compelling is the evidence uh, that many countries have been relying on uh, that suggests that Rwanda is uh, supporting the rebels directly? Is Rwanda the only country providing that kind of support to the rebels or are others involved as well? I think the compelling, the evidence is very compelling indeed that Rwanda is providing support to the M23. It's difficult to know how much support, however, and why. Uh, um, the, there have been various sources, including the UN group of experts, but also many other sources on the ground, Human Rights Watch, my own work on the ground, uh, suggests that there are these relationships, but it's difficult to say exactly how much support this is. So I think that there's no question about it, um, but it's what's not entirely clear is that why Rwanda uh, is really taking on a very large risk in, in providing support to the M23, and as we, of course, know, has see the consequences and uh, tens of millions of dollars of aid being cut. What about allegations of Ugandan support to the rebels? Ugandan support is, um, there certainly are allegations. There have been trucks that have come across the border from Uganda. I think that's the basis of most of these allegations. Um, I, I personally can't confirm the allegations. I don't think that anybody has solid evidence. About there are also allegations that other armed groups are being formed throughout the region. I think this is one of the key factors, actually, that people um, that we need to that we need to highlight. The M23 is but one of a larger network of armed groups that is being formed at the moment. And some of these armed groups, particularly the ones being formed further to the north, could very well have links to Uganda as well. So it's difficult to say at this stage, but there are some worrying signs, I think, in that direction. Uh, Mvemba Dizolele, just how legitimate are the uh, M23? Um, soldiers' demands. They say they want peace talks with the government. They say they simply want the government to adhere to some of the terms of the agreement signed back in March of, two, uh, of 2009, on the 23rd of March 2009, which stipulated that the Congolese government should also chase out some of these other rebel groups, namely the FDLR. Well, you know, the, um, the claims of the M23 in many ways bring to the fore the core of the issues. The core of the issues is the, uh, a weak state in Kinshasa, which has failed to assert its authority across the country, which means that, uh, you know, um, Marie Roger was talking about uh, the role of the government of self the DRC. You know, we point fingers at Rwanda and Uganda. They have their own role for sure. 
But the real problem, uh, part of the big problem, uh, the, the bigger side of the problem is in Kinshasa. In the sense, if, the M, if we got here with the M23, it's because we had negotiation with the CNDP, which is kind of the mother of the M23. Um, it's, it's, it's the uh, expression of these bad negotiations that have taken place between the government in Kinshasa and various groups of militias, integrating them into the military, but not really making them part of the larger structure, meaning you integrate militias, you keep them in the, in the areas of control with parallel uh, command structures, and then they don't really, they're not really part of your army, and they can decide at any moment to take the direction whichever that, uh, that they want. But also that's problematic because the country is moving in a democratic direction. So remember that the DRC had election in 2006 and then the election in 2011. Very problematic elections. But nevertheless, this is the way to go. Military solution do not lead anywhere. If that were the case, Congo will be at peace now. Congo has seen uh, sh um, all kind of waves of uh, rebellions and invasions, and yet we've not gotten where we need to be. But, so but there uh, still the premise is, is wrong. There still is a considerable vacuum in terms of security in the DRC, in the eastern part of the DRC, and that has been the case for many years. Uh, and the reality is that government troops continue to lose ground on the battlefield every single day to the M23 rebels. Can they then continue to resist the idea of negotiating with this group? Look, it's, the group needs to be taken seriously. Obviously, militarily, they have a lot of high power. They control a lot of ground. Uh, they can well take Goma. It's not, that's not uh, the point. The point is, if they take Goma or whatever other territory they take, what is next? We've seen this before. And typically what happens is that civilians suffer. So at this moment, we're talking about half a million internally displaced people, and some of them across the border, in the end, this kind of adventurism, as I call them, don't lead anywhere. So I think for all their grievances, we need also to keep in mind that these grievances are not just in the East. We often focus on the East. The problem of the failure of the state reper have repercussions across the country. In the East, it's, uh, it's worse because you have the militarization of the region. But you have the same problem in Equator, the same problem in Ituri, the same problem in Bakongo, and so on. So military solution, I think, has proven to be totally useless in solving the problem of the DRC. And it's time that we start talking about that. Uh, Jason Stearns, if the situation is as Mr. Dizolelo depicts it, that there are widespread uh, reasons for people to be discontent within the, uh, the DRC, not just in the eastern part of the country, until when can the government continue to ignore uh, the reality? Until when can it continue to resist these calls by the M23 uh, for negotiations? Will it have to happen if and when Goma, the, the largest city in the east, does fall to rebel hands? I think the government in Kinshasa has been encouraged by the amount of focus on Rwandan support to the M23. Uh, most international attention recently has focused, uh, to a certain extent, uh, rightly so, on Rwanda's support to M23. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to get find a solution simply by Rwanda bashing here. Uh, there, the fact of the matter, as Bemba pointed out, uh, is that there is no military solution. Kinshasa, even if with Rwanda withdraws, it's, uh, is, is sanctioned. Um, Kinshasa will not be able to impose a military solution, or it's not likely to be able to impose a military solution. So we need to think about a political solution in the East but one that does not bring us back to where we were in 2009. As you pointed out before, the M23 is, to a certain extent, a reincarnation of the CNDP that was reintegrated into the Congolese Army in 2009. So let's avoid a situation whereby, with, whereby which we integrate the M23 only to have another mutiny two or three years down the road. And uh, as some people have said, it'll be Groundhog, Groundhog Day all over again because We've gone through these cycles so many times in the Eastern Congo. So political negotiations, yes, but in a way in which it's more than just a sharing of the spoils and some of the underlying issues are addressed. And these underlying issues include problems of margin, social marginalization, problems over land tenure, uh, and also problems over army reform. Some of these things will be short-term measures uh, that can be fixed relatively easy, that can, be, uh, that can, be, can re-establish trust between the various sides. And some of them are measures that will take 
decades probably, such as state and army reform. So there has to, but there has to be a political solution to these issues and not just a mili military solution, because I don't think that necessarily is going to get us anywhere. And should there just be a regional, perhaps even local, uh, a local look at uh, ways to uh, end this crisis? Mary Roger Bilowa, what do you make of the issue of international pressure as well? We hear the U.S. State Department, Hillary Clinton, now criticizing openly Rwanda, its longtime ally, uh, urging it to cut all support for rebel groups, something we hadn't heard much from Washington up until now. Uh, how much of an impact can it have on the situation? I think it's a, a political and moral impact on the government of, in Kinshasa because until now they've been just whispering about uh, the uh, support of Rwanda even though it was an open secret. But now they have that backing to say now we know, we know the rebels are uh, supported by Rwanda and, uh, and uh, Uganda and they should stop. That's very important for them. But um, I don't, of course, uh, I, I don't think that uh, um, the United States or even Britain or whoever are changing their alliance now. They will, uh, Rwanda will still be the best friend, but I think their involvement has been too visible. Today we have some declarations, we have uh, condemnations, denunciations, you know, words, and maybe some facts that uh, uh, a little bit of money has been either reduced or just suspended for a while. So, but, so let, me, uh, let me, if I can... Really, I think it's a chance for, let for me, uh, the government of, uh, of DRC to, to really get support. Let me then put this uh, very point to Mr. Dizolele in Washington. Is Washington's decision now then to suspend military aid to the tune of some $200,000 uh, simply paying lip service? Is it too little, too late? Does it make much of a difference when there's so much at stake for so many regional powers? No, actually, it's a very good thing that the U.S. took the position it took. We should not focus on the money. I mean, uh, the $200,000, of course, it's nothing, it's peanut. Um, but the symbolism of it is more important, meaning for the first time over the last two decades, the United States finally came out and agreed with uh, the result of an investigation by the United Nations and other experts and took a position to condemn Rwanda in very clear way that nobody will miss. That is important because it sends a strong message. I think Washington, along with his allies, should continue putting pressure on Rwanda. I actually personally think that Rwanda has a unique position here to play a, posit a positive role in the region instead of always taking this military road. And this is the time, I think, if Rwanda can re-engineer itself, I don't know if that's possible, but I think the Rwandans have proven that they have solid leadership. We may not agree with them. We might have our issues with them. But I think they need to transcend their cleavages, the Hutu, Tutsi, all that stuff, and start playing a regional role, a positive regional role, because a weak DRC in the long run will be a problem for Rwanda. Uh, you know, regimes do not last forever. Eventually, they collapse. This is the time. Uh, for Rwanda and Uganda to play this regional role so that we'll have a positive integration. Remember, there is no animosity, no traditional animosity or natural animosity between the people of the DRC and the Rwandans. These people are friendly people. They've lived with each other for years without any problem. They're always small issues. But overall, this is not Palestinian, uh, uh, Israeli issues. This is a fabricated, manipulated issues, and I think we need to stop them. And still a very complicated picture. But for now, thanks to all my guests from Washington, D.C., Mvemba Dizolele from Berlin, Mary Roger Bilowa, and from Nairobi by Broadband, Jason Stearns. And thank you all very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can, of course, send us your feedback, as always, by emailing us your thoughts to insidestory at aljazeera.net. From Mirida Fakhri and the team, thanks for watching.